Thank you for braving the weather joining us today. It's really lopsided, I want you to know, side to side. I feel like I'm gonna fall over on the ship. <laughs> so let's go to the announcements. Today is our regular service, but I don't think we have time for this morning. Tuesday, holy yoga. Wednesday, Bible study, choir practice, board meeting. Yeah, and we usually don't do Bible study when we've got a board meeting. All right, so no board so, meeting. Or excuse me, the Bible study has a board meeting. Well, give me some grace today, baby. <laughs> uh, next Sunday, normal service. So there are information there. You can read the bulletin electronically if you would like it. If you would like to join me in the call to worship, it's from Psalm 28. Lord, you are my rock. I am calling to you for help. Don't close your ears. Do my prayers. I raise my eyes and pray toward your most holy place. Hear me when I call. The Lord is my strength. He is my shield. I trusted him, and he helped me. God, God save your people. Bless the people who belong to you. Join in our first song, Lead On, O King Eternal. Found in your hymnal, number 451. Forgiven our debtors, 
and lead us not, not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I believe we have a choir anthem. <laughs> sing your praise God and even though we are few in number and though we are weak and less than perfect and sometimes easily discouraged because you care for the humble you love those who seek you and because you dealt with our sins in the person of Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us who loves us today who loves us forever we can rest in you. Far seeing God, even when the air is blowing and the snow gets whipped up all around and what was supposed to be white pristine snow has dust all over the top of it, we remember that you will do everything that you have promised and you will complete the work in us that you started. Complete in our church the work that needs to be done. In this community, the work that your kingdom requires. We pray for those who share responsibility with us, for the world around us, so that they would discover your promises and praise your name. God, you have made so many things to bless us, houses and churches and water and boats and give people ideas for snowmobiles and speech and music and art and craft and 
worship, work, play for all your good gifts. We praise and we thank you. And in this world where good news is often unreported, we thank you for good things that have happened this past week, for answered prayers. We continue to bring our neighbors before you, our friends, our community, our country. We remember all of those who are troubled in body and mind, threatened by the enemies of well-being. Heal them and help them all, we pray. We thank you for the wonder of the gospel and everyone who has borne witness to the resurrection, and we thank you for those who have touched our lives for good, who, who care for us, for those who care with us about the good of humankind and who look with us for the fulfillment of your kingdom promises. God, we bless you for this great company of saints that has gone before us and now delight in your presence. And with them, we honor and praise your holy name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as they were taught to pray, so we do also pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. describe you by the, the work that you've done uh, or by your relationship to the Father and the Son. The creeds say that you are the one who is uh, worshipped and glorified with the Father and the Son. And 
I think that because some of those words fall short, it's a little hard for us to wrap our heads around the work that you do. But we recognize you, Spirit, as the presence of God in us. That you have taken up residence in us and that you guide our hearts and minds. And so, Spirit, we pray that you would do that this morning as well. As we dive into the text, we ask that you cause these words to become clear, well understood, and deeply planted in us. Speak to us, God. We ask it. In Jesus' name, because if you don't speak to us through your word, we are lost. And so, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our communion. Amen. <clears throat> so last week we had Pastor David here, and I was in Pastor David's church at Cheney Congregational, and one of the reasons that we really wanted to do that on the first Sunday of a month was to uh, experience what the other church's methods of doing uh, communion were like. Now, I understand that he had you go through like a, a little written liturgy. It was a, like a call and response thing. He showed that to me. Um, but then at, after that time, you distributed the elements the way that you normally do, right? Okay. So let me tell you what happened at Cheney. So as I got to uh, talk about uh, the table, and in, in the Cheney Congregation Church, they do not have a huge uh, piece of furniture like we do that is not, it, it, theirs is more smaller like this one. Uh, they still call it the altar. Now they could move it up and down much easier, but they don't. They just kind of put it right in the middle of their area. So imagine this one moved five feet forward. And they had it all decorated and ready for uh, communion. Now, because they tend to think of their table more like an altar, it's something that you bring things to and offer to God. They were, I did a lot of well, there's really no other way to say it. Almost priestly work, because I was standing between the representation of God and the people and going back and forth. I was the mediator in that time, like we've been looking at in the book of Hebrews. And of course, I remind them that that table is just a local representation of the big table that's in heaven, and so I... I I've gone through that with you with a number of times. I think it might have been new for them. And I did not do a liturgy with them. Just kind of explaining, this is how I understand what we're doing all together. And then we had communion the way that their congregation usually does. Which is, I break the bread, I pour the cup, I hand two separate cups to two deacons, and I hold the bread, people get up out of their seats and come to me and take the bread and then dip it in the cup and then they sit back down. So that's, we do that maybe once or twice a year. That's their regular practice. The reason why I'm making such a big deal about that is because different congregations have different understandings of what God has asked us as his gathered people, not just here, but everywhere, to do. Uh, the Catholic understanding of communion is radically different, for example, than the Protestant understanding. The reason I bring that up is because the Catholic understanding is about an ongoing offering. They actually will say the word that this is a sacrifice, that the, the Mass itself is a sacrifice. As Protestants, we don't tend to view communion like that. When Jesus said, it is finished on the cross, we take that to mean it is finished. So when we take communion, we, we remember what, we, what he has done. We 
proclaim his death until he comes again. But we don't tend to think that this is Jesus in the flesh on a little table. Why am I making this point? Because when so many different groups inside of Christianity have different understandings of the same event, I want to make sure that, that we're at least clear on, on what I'm thinking when we, for example, enter into the Lord's Prayer, which we've already prayed once. If you would turn in your Bibles with me, we were, are going to look at the Matthew example of the Lord's Prayer. It's in Matthew chapter 6. In your pew Bible, it's on page 1504. Matthew chapter 6. This is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And, and I want you to understand as we're turning to this, that, that this Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gives is him trying to explain to the people of Israel who already have in their minds, hey, we're God's people, we know how this whole God's kingdom stuff works. And he kind of, his first major teaching to the people hits a reset button like guys you you don't understand how the kingdom of god is supposed to work let me explain what this is like and so when he gets to how prayer is to function he gives us a model prayer to pray this this lord's prayer in matthew chapter 6. now i've covered this before uh, a few years ago, we went to the Gospel of Luke, and there is a passage in Luke that's the same thing. But I'm going to take a slightly different tack at it. What does this Lord's Prayer show us? We're going to start in chapter 6 at verse 7, and we'll go through 15. So let's just start 7 and 8, read these couple of verses. When you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So the first thing that the Lord's Prayer shows us is an ongoing offering on our end. His sacrifice is a done and completed and finished deal. That foundation is now laid. But we, like I talked about a couple of weeks ago, we build on that foundation. We are faithing with God. And so the offering that's, that's being lifted up as we pray is our very uh, selves. And so how do we do that? Verse 7 reminds us that we are not to keep on babbling. The, the word there, uh, King James translates that as vain repetition. Now, it's not... A rule about don't ever pray the same thing twice. I mean, let's face it, we pray the text of the Lord's Prayer every week. We repeat it. But it's not that we say the same three words over and over and over again in order to get God's attention. If we do that, it loses meaning. Now, some of you may not know this, but before I became a follower of Jesus as a teenager, I studied Buddhism pretty seriously for about a year and a half. And I had some friends who were teaching me how to meditate. And they gave me what's called a mantra. Just say a word over and over again and say it for a couple of hours and, and pay attention to the state that your mind goes in. And I said, well, does it have to be a special word? And they said, no, it could be any word. Just repeat it over and over again and try and drain everything else out and just focus on that word. So I was 13, 15, somewhere around there. I chose the word butter because why not? I'm not kidding. I'm not making this up and I'm not exaggerating anything. I sat in my basement where my room was and I meditated on the word butter for two and a half hours until the word butter ceased to mean butter. It just became this sense, right? And I got called up to dinner. And we had mashed potatoes. 
And my dad asked me to pass the butter, and I couldn't do it because I didn't know what it was. And he's pointing at it. This is the pass the butter. And I'm like, the what? The, the butter. The, how, how? The what? That rectangular yellow. Oh, yeah, this stuff. Oh, it's butter. <laughs> Vain repetition for vain repetition's sake does not lead us where God wants us to go. That's not the point of it. That's the warning that Jesus gives us. We don't pray to put ourselves in an alternate mental state. That's not why we repeat a prayer. We are not practicing magic. We don't need to specifically say a formula or a specific phrase for prayers to reach God. In fact, we don't need to even pray to reach God to let him know what's going on. Verse 8 reminds us that God already knows what we need to pray about. He knows every need that's on your heart. If you're wrestling with something, God knows what you're wrestling with. He doesn't need you to inform him of that as if it's a brand new piece of information that he doesn't know. Instead, the ongoing offering. We are offering up ourselves, our desires, as an ongoing reminder to us that we need God. Prayer isn't about teaching God something, telling God something he doesn't know. Prayer is about reminding us that we're not God, that we are getting off the throne of our lives. We are getting out of the driver's seat and turning our lives over to him. That's an ongoing offering in our end. The next thing, verses 9 and 10. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is emphasizing uh, pattern over procedure. The reason I'm saying that is because when Jesus says, this is how you should pray, he, he really makes the distinction. This is a skeleton. This is a framework on which you can hang your prayers. You, it's not that you need to say this specific set of words over and over again. It's a helpful Framework that gets us into the mode of prayer, as it were. When I was cast as the rabbi in Thither on the Roof, the, the script for the rabbi has a, a portion where he's supposed to pray for a sewing machine. And they ask him, is there a prayer for a sewing machine? And the rabbi's wonderful answer is, there's a prayer for everything. And I thought that was great. But... The script doesn't actually have the text of the prayer that the rabbi is supposed to pray. So many actors will just get to that point and mumble, 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 and then say the word sewing machine really loud at the end, and everybody will be like, ah, that's the prayer. I actually learned a whole bunch of Hebrew prayers, and they all start with the same phrase. Blessed art thou, O king of the universe. That's an opening phrase that's used in a lot of Hebrew prayers. I thought it was great. The idea that you can approach the king of the universe, the, the, the being who invented the vast reaches of time and space with your concerns about a sewing machine. God is accessible to us through prayer. And that prayer is not a Liturgy that always has to be said the same way exactly every time. This is a model prayer. If we look at verse 10, there's a couple of acts that happen in this first part. We admit that God is holy. We submit to his will. And both of those acts are all about God and not us. In other words, we put God first. pattern over procedure. This is an ongoing offering. We, we are using this as a skeleton on which to hang the meat of our prayers. 
And then finally, let's look at 11 through 13. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from the evil one. This is an offering that's done as an exchange. An offering that's done as an exchange. The couple of things that I, I loved about this, we get to this very simple phrase in verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. You know, I talk to you about every time I'm studying in, in the original language and I come across a, a single word, like maybe it's only found there in Scripture, and I get kind of excited because it's, it's going to force me to go into the rest of antiquity and, and look at your ancient Greek records and find out context for that word. Daily is worse than that. Because daily, the, the word that's, that we just translate daily isn't just a word that's only found one place in Scripture. This word, this particular word that we translate daily is only found here in all of Greek. It's not in Homer. It's not in Seneca. It's not in any ancient uh, language. It's just here. As far as we can tell, Matthew coined this term. And the, the way it's structured and phrased, they think that it's that he may have borrowed this term from, from business transactions. And that makes sense. Matthew's a fisherman. He would go out and he would gather the fish and then he would sell the fish. And so the, the transactional nature of his business, nobody, you know, he's not going to stand on the corner and say, I've got fish that's three months old. Who wants that? <laughs> you want fresh fish, right? lived in Nebraska for four years and there was a, a fish restaurant that we drove past almost every day and I thought there is no way I'm going in there because it says fresh fish and I'm thinking no. if it was swimming 20 minutes ago it was fresh if you caught that out of a lake someplace close it was fresh no lakes in that area so it wasn't that fresh this idea of daily is Think of this. There is this fairly new idea in business. The old ways of doing business, let's say I wanted to make a car part, well, I would contact somebody who uh, made steel, and I would put in a supply of steel, and then I would have that steel in my warehouse, and then I would turn that into car parts, and then I would attach them all together, so they, you build up inventory. Well, now they have this thing called just-in-time inventory. And it's basically getting everybody's schedules coordinated to where the guy who makes the steel makes like one batch of it. And as soon as he's done with it, he ships it to the car guy. And as soon as the car guy gets it, he forms it into the pieces he needs, and he makes one car, and then that car is shipped to the, and it's sold right away. They don't keep large stocks of inventory if you're practicing this just-in-time thing. And as long as everything runs smooth, it keeps your costs down, it keeps uh, the wheels of industry flowing right away. The word daily here is a just-in-time thing. Think back to when the Children of Israel were wandering around the desert and they didn't have any food. And they said, God, we're all going to starve out here. Why would you do this? And God says, It's okay, I will send you bread. Bread is going to fall from the heaven. Man. And you're going to go out every day and pick up this bread. You are not going to go pick up a week's worth and then sit at home and just make up manna recipes. That's not what's going to happen. Every day, you go out and you get it. Friday, because I don't want you working on Saturday. I'll have two days worth of stuff. You can gather two days worth. You can put one in a jar and it won't be bad. But if you try it any other time, that other jar is going to go bad. It's going to get worms and it's kind of an interesting and slightly disgusting description. If you it's kind of fun. God wants us to daily, regularly depend upon him. That's what daily bread is. We give up verse 12 
owning, I'm sorry, owing, we give up owing as we give up being owed. Talking about debts. <clears throat> the word here really does mean debt. It does not mean trespass. That's from a, a translation of the common book of prayer in England. So, I mean, if, if a church wants to use trespasses, that's cool, but there's a little English going on in there. Old English. This, the, the word debts, look, we all know that we owe God everything we have. If you'd like to say you made it all yourself from scratch, I'm going to say, great, where'd you get the dirt? We owe God everything we have. And because we recognize that it's all in his court, we can't turn around and force someone out like, you owe me. We got to hold all that stuff really loosely. Stop holding on to what binds us. And verse 13 Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You gotta hear this. God does not lead us into temptation. God does not tempt us at all. The Job portion that Chris read, God does not do the work of evil. He doesn't lead us. He doesn't tempt us. Uh, some people will translate that test us as if you know, God, we, we don't want you to test us too hard. And I that's a better translation. The book of James says, look, if if you're tempted, not if, when, when you're tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he's dragged away and enticed. We are in a broken environment of sin. The, the universe itself is busted. It's out of alignment, and it constantly drags toward sin. And that's the vehicle in which we have to live. So, of course, we're out of alignment and go along with it. And we have to recognize this. We're going on course. We need to correct for that. God, don't let me be dragged off course unaware, is, I think, another way of looking at this. But instead, deliver us from the evil one. If you ever been driving on a long stretch and you're really tired, then this starts to... And then you turn up the music and you start singing out loud because a four-hour long road trip is actually a four-hour live concert starring you. <laughs> At least that's how it is for me. I have to put on music that I know really well, that I can sing really loud with if I'm really tired, so that that way I don't crash. Lord, I just need to sing long enough and loud enough to get me to the next Starbucks, and then I'll be fine. We are asking God to help us counteract the weight of sin in our lives. You know, there are, frankly, all kinds of temptations that happen in the world that are never going to attract you. That's not your failing. But when one of them is your failing, that's what gets your attention. God allows us to experience challenging situations so that we can return over our lives to him, the very process of prayer itself. Let me close with this, verses 14 and 15. When you fast, I'm sorry, 14. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is about equity. As we forgive, we're dependent upon God to forgive us. We are forgiven. And if we don't let go of our right to justice then we've got no right to ask for mercy if somebody wrongs me I have a right for redress but Jesus says don't practice revenge let God take care of that I'd rather 
of God's infinite mercy than my limited sense of justice. And in order for me to remember that on a regular basis, I gotta pray. So let's pray. God, this idea of ongoing dependence upon you is challenging in us. And then recognizing that 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 you expect us to be to, to live in equity, to allow you to be the, the judge of all, even when people are doing things that drive us nuts. Is another way of reminding us that we are not you, that we are not God, that we don't have the power and the authority to make our will be done on earth. Because it's not about our will in the first place. It's about your will. Help us to lean into that, to allow your will for us to be the, the corrective that brings us back into alignment with you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together, glorify your name, number 246, and then we'll receive our offering as well.
just be some uh, rote thing that we do because we're supposed to. But God, help us remember that, that this prayer, this model of prayer you've given us is a, is a framework and we bring everything in our lives to you. As a way of reminding ourselves that we aren't calling the shots. Do that in us, Lord. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's join together. Thank you.